I'm the Tim part of the Tim and Med Hat show, and uh, it is my pleasure to be here with, with all of you and to be engaging in what we hope is a dialogue on this topic. We don't propose to have all the answers, uh, but we hope to, pro to pose a few questions at least. Uh, my involvement with the YMCA is, uh, spans about six years. Uh, I joined the board about six years ago. I was vice chair for several years and in, uh, had responsibility for our fundraising effort. And then I took over as chair just this past September. And uh, I'm Ed Hatt, and I've been with the YMCA for 37 years. So I've had a, a, a journey through the Y around diversity and social inclusion, but also around the great work that the Y uh, does. I, am, I feel very privileged to be the CEO of our Y at this point in time, and I'm very pl privileged uh, to be here with you. Uh, this is where I went to university, University of St. Michael's College, so this has a very uh, soft spot in my heart. So, uh, a show of hands, how many of you have worked out in a YMCA facility? Maybe you've gone swimming in one of our pools. Several, okay, that's good. Um, how many of you have a child or maybe you know a child who goes to a YMCA uh, summer camp, either an overnight camp or a day camp, or maybe takes part in one of, uh, is a, enrolled in one of our childcare facilities? Several, okay. Um, how many of you uh, got help finding a job at a, at a uh, YMCA employment center or perhaps got help settling in Canada as a newcomer to this country? Okay, not, so, not quite so many. Okay. Well, um, what I'd like to show you is a slide here that talks about who we are, uh, demonstrates our, our reach throughout the greater Toronto area. We cover five regions. Uh, we work with over 160,000 children, youth and adults of all backgrounds and abilities, helping them to get active and lead an active lifestyle. Every day, uh, in one of our 260 childcare sites, every day there are 16,000 children that receive quality care uh, from our YMCA. Uh, summer camp, summer is upon us, so summer camp season means that over 23,000 children and youth will participate in YMCA programs, uh, hoping to gain confidence, develop leadership skills, and we focus a lot on environmental awareness. Now, the YMCA is a charity that believes deeply in the importance of belonging and social inclusion. And as part of our commitment to ensuring our programs are accessible to people of all backgrounds, we do provide financial assistance to people who cannot afford the full fee. So right now, about 25% of our health and fitness members receive financial assistance because they cannot afford the full fee. 21% of our childcare uh, families receive that and 40% of children who come to camp receive financial assistance. So we work uh, very, very much with uh, people of all backgrounds, ages, abilities, and uh, social income. One thing I, I do want to share with you is that um, uh, our annual budget is $190 million. When you look at the scope of our reach, um, so sometimes people think we're this big organization, and actually, we're the conglomeration of a number of neighborhood-based program sites. The way we look at ourselves is being very neighborhood-based, bringing everyone together to see how we can work more efficiently uh, to provide services to our community. So in total, we reach about 400,000 people across the GTA each year. And each of those centers that, that Meta talks about is, serves as a center of community uh, that can serve that local group in, in terms of social service delivery. Now we could talk at length about what we do, but what we want to do today is talk more about the leadership and the governance roles that we have at the Y. And we hope that that will stimulate the discussion that should come later. So one of, one of the resources we're recommending, and some of you may have seen it, is a video by Simon Sinek that talks about starting with why and how inspiring leaders always start with why. Uh, he says that inspiring organizations think, act, and communicate with, by the way, when I say why, it's not the YMCA why, it's W-H-Y, uh, the reason we do what we do, and you'll see that in our uh, five good ideas. 
So we start um, in terms of the relationship with our board. Uh, we believe that alignment around the why, in other words, a shared vision and values, is an essential starting point for a successful executive board relationships. So here's where we start. We start with this idea that, that we need a shared vision and values, and, and let's talk about the values side first. If any of you have ever set foot in a YMCA, you have probably seen these words, caring, honesty, inclusiveness, respect, responsibility, and health. Those are the YMCA values. And that they are at the center, those words are at the center of everything that we do. In fact, they're on the wall, they're uh, painted on the wall of the meeting room where our board meets. And there's never, so there's never any doubt as a board as to the values that should be guiding our work. And our vision is that our communities will be home to the healthiest children, teens, and young adults. This is part of a strategic plan that we call Strong Start, Great Future. Uh, it's ambitious, it's bold, and it's risky. Uh, we are currently in year five of this plan, and just under a year and a half ago, we launched a $250 million campaign with the intent to build 10 new YMCA centers of communities within the next 10 years. It's pretty bold, pretty aggressive, but what we believe is if we can bring more YMCA programs to more people in more communities, that more young people, their families, adults in the neighborhood, will be able to achieve a better sense of health. We would not stand a, a chance of achieving this if we didn't have the combined talents of our staff and our volunteer board behind it. That's why we've uh, ensured the development of our vision and plan was a collaborative process between the board and the senior team. I have a very personal connection to the plan because it was uh, approved April 15th in 2010, which was the same board meeting where they approved my appointment. So I feel very connected to this plan. Uh, and because we want our board to be fully involved and engaged, at our last board retreat, we realized we only had a few board members remaining who had been part of the development of our vision. And this was done, the vision was developed five years ago. So we spent a lot of time at our board retreat under Tim's leadership in what we called a strategic planning redux session to bring new members into the tent. And that's one of the things that we constantly work on is how do we make sure as new members come on, they, uh, they, they, they come into the tent. So alignment on the vision and values is, is critical. It requires continued diligence. But once you have it, you have the opportunity to truly channel the full talents of your board and staff at a single ambitious, bold, and yes, even risky vision. So, so I've been on lots of boards, and um, at their worst, um, boards are dogmatic exercises in Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, it is simply a rubber stamping of the things that management wanted to do anyway. Uh, but by having a shared vision and a shared, a common set of values, the intent is that it raises everybody's game to a higher level. It causes everybody around the board table to think bigger about what our legacy could be uh, in, in terms of our collective work. So that shared vision and values is going to look different for each of the organizations that you represent, but it's critically important to have and to use, to pull it out of the drawer and actually use it in your meetings uh, to guide the discussion. Now, once, uh, once we know what our vision is, we then try to build a board with a diversity and skills matrix that will enhance our ability to achieve it. And so that's our second idea. Uh, define the diversity and skills matrix needed to help us achieve our vision. So it has to be a matrix, hence the uh Hence the slide. Uh, now it used to be that boards were populated by people who, who already knew each other. Um, they, would, they would recruit their friends to also be on the board and so boards were made up of old white men. Um, over time, boards have started to take into account other factors, gender diversity, ethnic and racial diversity, age diversity, 
And these are important improvements. But in addition, you also have to consider diversity of opinion, diversity of skills. That's where the matrix comes in. Uh, you need to build a board that reflects and understands the diverse communities that each of us serves. So uh, you need to ask yourself, each board has to ask itself, what are the issues that we're going to face over the next coming years? And then proactively re recruit around those issues. For example, um, are you going to launch an awareness building campaign over the next couple of years? If you are, it might be helpful to have somebody on your board who has communications in their background. Uh, in our case, we're planning a massive uh, capital expansion program. We went and sought out people who were experts in real estate to join our board. Now, before using uh, a matrix approach to our existing board uh, composition, uh, our board members would have recommended people they knew for vacancies. And we would have had maybe five candidates each year. Since we've made that change, we now have 35. And I gotta put in a plug for Matri who's been very supportive in helping us widen our net, and we really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, once, once we plant the seed of diversity, our reach extends. And you know, it's the old saying, we don't know what we don't know. And by widening the net, uh, we're able to, to find things that we never thought uh, could help us. Over time, uh, greater diversity leads to greater extension, and a richer, and the pool to choose, and a richer pool to choose from. So in our plan to build 10 YMCAs in 10 years, we're in the GTA, um, and we would like to expand into places like York Region and Peel Region, and so we are in the process of recruiting people who are influential uh, in those reasons, who are aligned with our vision and our strategy, but can also bring that community connectedness to us. So we want to move on to the next idea, which is, um, is that investing the time and, the, and opening ourselves up to the vulnerability needed to build a trusting relationship between the board and the executive director. Now this is an idea that, that sounds really easy, but in, a, in, in essence it's one of the hardest things to do. It's the importance of trust. So how do you build trust when technically uh, the board, and in particular the board chair, is the CEO's boss? Um, that's why it's important that the board and the board chair adopt a philosophy of, let's call it servant leadership. And that is that I am here to serve Medhat in pursuit of the organization's vision. How can I enable him for the journey that we're going to go on together? How can I take barriers out of his way? Uh, how can I help him get the resources that he needs? How can I perhaps energize him if that's what he needs, energize him for what needs to be done. Who else might we be able to get to help us on this journey? So I can best serve the organization and I can best serve Medhat by asking those questions. Not by putting on the hat of boss, but by putting on the hat of servant leader. Uh, that means that we have to have a very open, very unstructured, very free-flowing, ongoing dialogue. We've got to both be willing to invest the time to actually build a relationship, to get to know each other, and to demonstrate a willingness to learn from each other the things that we don't know, that we have very, very different backgrounds. Our actions are going to speak a lot louder than our words. So as, uh, as a CEO, it can be hard to be open yourself to the vulnerability required to build trust. Uh, to get to the role I'm in, I uh, have to be a leader. Now, there are some definitions of leadership that include ideas around having all the answers and making all the decisions. Um, I've tried that at home and it doesn't work. Uh, but to me, the willingness to tell Tim or another board member when I have a problem or could use some advice is not about admitting weakness. It's about recognizing they may be, um, they may be able to bring a different perspective and understanding to the challenge that I'm facing. For example, many of our board members, including Tim, are themselves experienced leaders, CEOs, and when I have a challenge, if I have a staffing challenge, I need some advice on being able to turn to other leaders to ask if they've been in my shoes and how they've handled it, it's a great resource. And the one thing that allows me to be vulnerable and open is this constant reminder 
that the work we're doing is not about me as CEO, but about the impact that we're trying to have in our community. And that's the big driver. So the next idea that we want to share is that we need to each play our positions. Like in any sport, playing positions is important. When you get right down to it, you have to ask yourself, what, how does a board member truly add value? What is it that is a board member's job? I think the biggest job that we have as board members is to ask questions. Uh, not by providing the answers, but by, but by asking questions. Even naive questions can help the organization to think out of the box. In fact, sometimes the naive questions are the best ones. Boards break down when people try to play the other person's position. That's when boards step into operations, for example. It's hard for a lot of us. It's difficult playing a board role when what you do the rest of your life is you're the leader of some other organization or you're the leader of an initiative. You're used to being the person in charge, the man with the plan, if you will. But this is a different role. This is a role about asking questions and leaving it at that, listening for the right answers. That's the job. So um, that the, the, it only, you know, the truth of the matter is that we're only involved a few days a month in the activities of this organization. So we don't honestly have the day-to-day -day exposure to solve day-to-day -day problems. It's important for us to remember that and for us to, to, um, uh, to, to mind, be mindful of that because frankly otherwise we get into some sort of a power struggle between what I do and what Medhat does. And from my experience on a board, relationships develop over time. Uh, Tim, as an example, served previously as a vice chair, chaired our development committee, and has been an active board member. He and some of our other board members are people I've been getting to know over the last five to six years. This relationship building gives both board members and myself, as well as my senior leadership team, time to get to know not just the roles, but also the personalities. To figure out the best way to communicate with each other, if ever there is a feeling of people starting to play the wrong position. For example, uh, I've seen times in our board meetings when a board member may have asked a question in a way that left one of my team feeling defensive about an operational decision. In those instances, it helps that based on my relationship with the person, I have a sense of trust. I have a sense of their good intentions. I might be able, which I do quite often to rephrase, reframe the question so that we can take advantage of the strategic level before turning it back to my staff member to answer. So we do a lot of work in terms of really wanting to listen to what the questions are and reframing them in a way that um, helps us to move forward. Our last of our five ideas is that measurement matters. One of the, one of the best ways that you can help, that the board can help themselves to elevate out of the day to day, elevate the discussion to a more strategic level, is to put in place a really solid measurement system. So what are the critical measures that will help the board to know that they're on track? What measurements will allow us to foresee the big picture challenges and the opportunities that might lie ahead? So on our board, we have a strategic dashboard coded green, yellow, and red for those things that are on track, those things that are slightly off track, and the red things being those things that are definitely off track. And we keep track of a variety of key performance indicators. And then we have a separate dashboard for our capital development projects to make sure that all of the milestones are being hit. Again, all coded red, yellow, and green. And from my manufacturing days, you know, the, the rule is no gap, no yap. So if, there's, if, 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 if things are green, there's no need to talk about them. It's the yellows and the reds that deserve some discussion at the board table. So here's a practical example. Many of our board members use the YMCA fitness facilities. They're in our gyms regularly. And as you can imagine, they see and hear about a host of problems. Equipment that might need a bit of repair, there might be a lack of towels on, this, on a particularly busy day, or there might be some staffing issues, or there might be program scheduling conflicts. It can be really easy for board conversations to spiral downward into the, into the minutiae, all these little things. There was a lack of towels today at this facility. 
Okay, um, so we can get sucked into the weeds. But if we put in place, by putting in place a measurement system, we, me we measure member delight, as we're calling it. Okay, so are members delighted with the total experience of coming to the YMCA? By measuring that, we can now see progress across a much broader horizon. We can start to spot whether issues are starting to happen in a specific location or, or in, in total. Now we can start to, that, that elevates the discussion to a strategic level. It's not about whether there were towels missing at, the, at such and such a gymnasium at this time. It's much more about member delight in total. That's a board issue, and that's something that the board needs to monitor and needs to have their finger uh, on top of, okay? So the measurement system elevates the discussion. Now, and I have to say, on a personal level, I really appreciate that because during my career, I, and I, I did clean, wash, and fold towels and put them out. <laughs> and I thought once I became CEO, I didn't have to worry about towels anymore. <laughs> so, so I appreciate that approach. But I do echo uh, Tim's point that establishing and bringing regularly to our board the right metrics, and the right, the right metrics is the key word here, uh, helps to focus our discussion. It also, uh, it also helps staff better anticipate what additional information to provide the board. We know what the dashboard is going to be saying about uh, where we are, we're headed, we're ahead of or behind before we share it. And so along with Tim, my team and I can determine uh, what questions this might raise and what other information we might bring to answer these questions. Like the shared vision and values, it's important to develop metrics together. You don't want your scorecard to own you, but be a shared tool to help drive us toward our shared goals. And a number of the things that we look at are not just related to capital and operations, but also to our vision, our mission, and our, our work as a charity. So, 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 I guess we have three questions for you to consider at your table discussions. First off, uh, do you agree that trust is important, and what are one or two concrete actions that you would suggest for an executive director and a, and a, a board to take to build trust. So trust being one. Secondly, <clears throat> using a shared vision and values as a barometer. Where do you think you are today? And what might you do to move up by a digit? And then thirdly, uh, how do you keep your board out of the day-to-day -day operations and focused on big strategic issues? We'd ask you to think about those three things, talk about it amongst your table, and then that'll hopefully give us some ideas that we can take back and we can also uh, start a dialogue in the room. Thank you. Okay? Thanks.